If you've been driving a long time, if you've gotten to drive and do some traveling, every so often you'll find yourself on what might become a favorite road. I have some favorite highways in my life. Uh, Route 1 down through the Florida Keys is a favorite highway. I just love driving from island to island. That's always been a good one. There's routes up through Michigan along the shoreline, Route 36. That's always uh, been a favorite of mine. But out in Colorado, there's a Route 24. Route 24 goes out of Colorado Springs. It heads straight west. It's where I go every summer to go to the mountains and uh, a little town called Buena Vista. On the way there, uh, Route 21 takes you up and around Pikes Peak and then over the pass and then through the highlands. And uh, there's a place with a scenic pull-off, a scenic view pull-off. Um, you pull over there. I, every year I take the guys out backpacking. We pull off there. And we stand there, and, and across the horizon is the Continental Divide with just snow-capped mountains all the way along it. it I, I talk sometimes about uh, that I can get an empty cup in my life. Uh, emotionally, uh, spiritually sometimes I can have an empty cup, dangerously low cup. Uh, something about going to the mountains always has a chance for that cup to be refilled. One of the reasons is, is because of the closeness I feel to God out there. I, it's not that I don't feel closeness to God right here, right now, I do. There's just something about being in the splendor of, of those mountains. And the reason is, is because I'm suddenly hit straight in my face with that the God who made all of that is my God. <laughs> my God's the one who made all that. And I just love that moment. Getting into the mountains is always a moment of transformation, of, uh, of God teaching us. This year, I was in Psalms while I was out there, and I was in Psalm 23, and it was in a valley that I was one morning as I was in Psalm 23. And it, it dawned on me how dark the valley stayed. The peaks out there in the Rockies are so tall, it takes a long time for the sun to break over. And so, you know, it's morning time, you're up, you're getting ready to start hiking, you still have a jacket on because the shadow of those mountains are still on you, and that's how you begin your day. I, I tell you that because King David will spin a phrase today that is often read at funerals, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. That, that little moment of that shadow has fallen on many of us. And, and maybe it's not a death, but there's valleys. We all go through them. Maybe you're in a valley right now, but there's something very, very dark about that valley of death. We don't like to talk about that much. Being in Psalm 23 forces the conversation a little bit. My brother passed away at age 36, way back in uh, 2000. Left a young wife and a two-year-old daughter. Most of you know this story. My brother was just a delight. My dad would tell stories of my brother for years after his death. My dad would just get to giggling when my brother was around. His crazy antics, his questionable jokes, his twisted humor. It, just, it could just fill a room with giggles. And when my dad would start retelling these stories from my brother's life, we'd all start laughing again. It, and for a, a short moment, it almost felt like Jeff was back with us. And then the stories would stop and the laughter would die down. And then you could see it in my dad's face. That, that chin would stiffen. Uh, he'd look down or look away from the family. He'd be fighting tears again. And years after, years after my brother's death, my dad would still have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death again. I'd imagine if you lose a child, that's something that stays with you a long, long time. Why is this phrase so important today? We're going to talk about this shepherd who protects us, and he protects us from enemies, and death will be the big enemy in our life. Uh, just to recap for a little bit before we get going, David is going to do something really amazing today, and it's, it's, it's done on purpose. God's going to use this in our lives he changes pronouns. This whole time, verses 1 through 3, it's been he, he, he. He leads me. He guides me. He restores me. David has been talking about God. But when he gets to that valley, 
when he talks about walking through this valley, he changes pronouns. It's no longer he, 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 now it's you, you, you. It, it's, he's talking to God now. And oh my goodness, for any of us who are going through a valley, this is so important to, to catch this, to be talking to God. It, in, on a Sunday morning, I'm preaching, and it'd be as if, like right in the middle of telling you about God, suddenly I started talking to God. <laughs> oh Lord, how long do I have to put up with these people? Private conversation, sorry for that. That's what David does. This pronoun shift is not by accident. Let's talk about this a little bit. Again, I'm not going verse by verse, just themes. Look at verse 5, what verse 5 says. Uh, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We talked about the table last week because the shepherd's feeding us, but today I need to focus on that word enemies. There are enemies that have followed us home. The Lord is the host. He's invited us into his tent. He's invited us into his shelter. But guess what? Someone has followed us home. Someone who wants to take us out. Someone who wants to hurt us. Someone who wants to kill us. And in the middle, in the middle of them being at the door knocking, here's the host, the Lord, who's telling you, now don't worry about that. I got that. Eat. And you're like, well, wait a minute. There's, there's an enemy at my door. I know, I got that. You eat. Enemies come and knock at our doors all the time. There's enemies knocking at my door right now. There's probably some in your life. Fear comes and tries to get in. Worry. Relationship troubles. uh, Financial troubles. Depression. Stress death they stand at the door of your heart and they're trying to get in and they knock and they knock someone else is standing at your door knocking too jesus says i stand at the door and i knock and anybody who opened the door i would come into them and we'd eat together the shepherd how do you deal with these enemies at the door it begins each day when you start with the phrase The Lord is my shepherd. You're not the shepherd. He is. And he says, he's prepared a table in the presence of my enemies. Oh, there's more in Psalm 23 that implies protection. There's that verse 4. It talks about a rod and a staff. They comfort me. You know, this whole time, I always made that the same thing. A rod and a staff were the same thing. Because when you picture a shepherd, you picture a shepherd standing there. He's got that long staff. It, it goes up. It has that crook in the top. Yeah, there's two items here. And this really jumped out at me this time. There's two different items. I know what the staff is. What is the rod? And you look it up, and oh my goodness, you should picture a, uh, a smaller baseball bat. You should picture a, a two-foot-long uh, club. Made of oak, uh, probably had spikes in it, nails, and it hung off the shepherd's waist. This is the item he used for fighting off uh, anything that would come at the sheep. Sheep are vulnerable to attacks. They're vulnerable to wolves and and. And uh, all through the Bible, the Bible talks about how the sheep are going to get attacked. But the shepherd's there, and the shepherd's prepared, and the shepherd's ready, and he's got this rod on this hip. And when the sheep see that he has his resources, that he's ready to protect them, they're comforted by that. I mean, only a two-foot, a two-foot uh, club? What? Do you realize how close... That allows the predators to get to the shepherd. I mean, they're nose to nose, toe to toe, going at it. And this shepherd fights for us. When you see the phrase, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, it means that, that this shepherd is ready to battle for you. And sometimes we think God does a hands off and allows Satan to just have his way with us, and that's not the case. He's fighting for you. In fact, if you want a great study through the Old Testament, studying words, uh, go in and look at all the times it says the Lord will fight for you. One of those great times is when Moses, in the life of Moses, he has led Israel out of Egypt. He's leading them out of slavery. God is redeeming them and freeing them, and it's a great moment. But God leads them and backs them right up against the Red Sea. 
And then they look over their shoulder, and who's coming down on them? The Egyptians. And they're freaked out. Hey, Moses, did you bring us out here to kill us? Is that what you did? There wasn't enough graves in Egypt they accused Moses of. And Moses will stand up, and a word from the Lord will fall on Moses, and he will say these words, Exodus 14, do not be afraid. Stand firm today, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And that word still there implies trust. He's going to fight for you. Yes, the enemies come knocking, but our God is a warrior. And no enemy gets close to you that doesn't first go through the shepherd. Do you understand that? So, we got enemies knocking at the door. He's equipped with a rod and a staff. Now let's get back to that big enemy that we all have to face, death. In verse 4 then is that phrase, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Boy, that, nobody wants to talk about death. You don't, you don't host parties and invite a bunch of people over and say, hey, we're going to have refreshments and drinks and stuff, and then we're going to talk about death. Come on over, this will be great. You don't do that. It takes a funeral usually before we have the freedom to talk about death a little bit. God often talks about it. Solomon said it's not wise to ignore the subject of death. We need to be talking more about it probably. But inside this verse, which has everything to do with death, there is so much hope inside of there. First of all, there's that word shadow. I've said this many times, but for all of our new people, um, we had an elder uh, years ago. He's no longer with us. He's in heaven now. But Paul Odom, he loved this phrase. He used to teach us about the shadow of death. He would tell us, a shadow cannot hurt you. The shadow of a sword cannot cut you. The shadow of a serpent cannot bite you. And the shadow of death does not hold you. Oh, man. It's just a shadow. That shadow can't hurt. Me, this year, uh, that word through jumped out at me. He, he's taking me through this valley. Do you see the hope in that, that this valley is only temporary. His plan is, is that he and I get through this valley together. Did you catch that? When valleys come in our life, nobody wants valleys. Nobody goes, woohoo, I got another valley. This is awesome. But when we are in the valleys of life, and they come in all different forms, he's taken me through this. There, there's a reason that he wants me to go through this. And when I go through this valley, I land on that last phrasing, I will fear no evil because you're with me. You're right there beside me. Yeah, I don't have to be afraid of death. As one man put it to me, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> you know. No, death is temporary. Death is not something that holds us for long. Yes, you're going to have valleys in your life. Can I remind you of the words of Jesus in John 16? <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble. That's Jesus saying, you should count on it. It's coming. Job says, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Boy, they sure are. But I don't like valleys. I dread verse 4 in my life. Yeah, so do I. Couldn't we have just left that one out? Why me? Why do I have to go through this valley? Can I tell you about a few valleys that we all get thrown at us? Satan throws valleys at us, that's true. Uh, he's trying to pull you away from your trust in God, so that's going to happen. Um, some valleys are self-inflicted by our own poor, poor judgments, our own poor decisions. We put ourselves in valleys and they're self-inflicted. And once in a while, we're thrown into a valley by somebody Somebody was really close to us, somebody we really love, somebody we really cared about, and, and that person can take a big chunk out of us. And it hurts, and it hurts for a long time. Um, healing is happening. You don't always see it. It takes, it takes a while to see the healing that God has brought. The scar remains. Um, Back in 1986, I was in a bad car accident and uh, destroyed this shoulder over here. And it was uh, emergency rooms and doctors. And then next thing I know, I'm being whisked into a surgery. And then there's 
pins and plates and things like that later. And when I was all done, I was told, you know, you're probably only, you know, you're probably only going to have about 70% use of your shoulder from here on in. I actually recovered to 95, which I'm very thankful for, 95% use of this shoulder, and uh, still went on to do a lot of great things. The, the pain was severe, severe. Uh, the pain's gone. The limitations aren't noticeable. But I look in the mirror and I still see that scar. It's, it's a reminder of that, that valley I had to go through, physical valley. Some of us in this room, we've been in a valley for so long, it's left such a deep scar, we're having a hard time getting through this, getting through it. And, and for some of us in this room, I'm just going to say it, uh, you've been camping in the valley. You, you hit that valley, and you just put up a tent, and you've just decided to stay there. And you need to be reminded that God is trying to bring you through that. You need to get up. You need to put one foot in front of the other. You need to trust Him. You need to start each day acknowledging that the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's guiding me. He's going to take you through a few valleys, but he hasn't left you. You're not abandoned. You're not on your own. He's right there, and his plan is to bring you through, through it. And so we got to allow him to bring us through. King David, in Psalm 23, has been assessing his life, and he says, you know, from beginning to end, I can see that, that God has been with me the whole time. In fact, if, if there's any message from King David, it's, hey, God's got this. We, we can calm down and relax. God's got this. It goes all the way back to when he was just a, a boy, 1 Samuel 17. He, he's a shepherd boy who his father, Jesse, said, hey, take this food to your brothers. They're, they're in a battle. They're in a war. And David shows up on the battlefield. The Philistines are on one hill. Uh, the Israelites are on another this champion has come out. Hey, there's no reason for us to all fight. There's no reason for us to all die. Our champion will fight your champion. Let's, let's let that happen. And, and there's this giant down in the valley. This giant of a man down in the valley. And he's taunting and calling out the Israelites. Bring one down. Bring your best soldier. Let's fight it out. And nobody goes from Israel's side, but... David says to the King Saul, he goes, I'll go. And King Saul says, you're only a boy, you can't do this. Do you remember David's credentials at that point? He presents his resume, do you remember? Hey, I, I'm a shepherd, I was keeping my father's flock. A lion came in and attacked one time, a bear came in and attacked one time. Both times I rescued the lamb right from their mouth. And I took them by the hair and I killed them. You, you can almost get the image of that, of that rod coming out and him just killing a lion and a bear to save that sheep. And he says, what the Lord, Lord has always been with me. If he's protecting me from a lion and a bear, he'll certainly put this Philistine down today. He will give this Philistine into my hand. And King Saul says, all right, go. David runs down there to the battlefield. He grabs five rocks. You know the story. He, he's down there and he's having this conversation with this giant. And this giant's offended by David. What? Am I just a dog? You send a boy down here? He says, today, David, you'll, the birds will eat you today after I kill you. And David says, oh, no, no, no. You got that wrong. It's the other way around. Today, the Lord will give you into my hand. And there's this little part that I never paid attention to, but David runs toward Goliath and attacks him. This whole time in my imagination, Goliath attacked David. That's not what happened. Little David attacks the giant in the valley. Goes right at him. He lets go of that rock. It sinks deep into the giant's forehead. He falls face first into the dirt. David doesn't even have a sword. He goes over, he draws the sword of Goliath, and he drops it on his neck and severs his head. Really, really cool part, by the way, is for the next 30 days, David carries the head of Goliath back to Jerusalem. My Sunday school teacher never told me that cool part. 
That is awesome. So when David finally pens Psalm 23, I can always see that God's been here. Oh, that shadow of death part. Don't forget David buried a a baby. Don't forget David stood at the grave of his grown son, Absalom. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Dying doesn't scare us. Oh, it scares the secular world. Oh, it scares someone who's not rightly connected to Jesus. It should scare them. But for those of us who are Christians, death does not scare us. Why? The Scriptures tell us that my birth date and my death date have already been put in place by God. God had already determined the day I'd be born, and God determined the day I would die. The Lord said, this is exactly how long I want Ron to be on this earth. It won't be a second past. It won't be a second short. God's already put that in place, and nothing changes it, and I don't change it either. So what do I have to be afraid of? When you go to buy a gallon of milk, somebody sends you to go buy a gallon of milk, what do you look for? Come on, tell me, what do you look for? Expiration date. Last service, somebody said cheapest price. Like, how long, Lord? <laughs> no. <laughs> you look for the expiration date. That's, that tells you how long the milk's going to be good for, the expiration date. Ron came with an expiration date. And so did you. It's out of your hand. So what are you going to be afraid of today? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, David says, I will fear no evil because you are with me. I need you to hear that phrase. You are with me. It was a little first grader. He had spent the weekend at the circus. He got to school, and the teacher had a little assignment. Everyone's going to get up and give a little speech as to what they want to be when they grow up one day. And the teacher had heard it all. She didn't hear what this little first grader was about to say. He stood up and he said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a lion tamer. She's like, man, all the doctors and lawyers and the astronauts that I've heard of through the years and the car racers, she goes, I've never heard a little boy say I want to be a lion tamer. And he talked about the circus. But he said, one day when I get bigger, he said, one day. I'm going to be a lion tamer. And he said, I'm going to go into that cage, and there's going to be many fierce lions, and they're going to be growling at me and swatting at me. And then almost as if he had a second thought, he paused for a moment, and then he said, well, my daddy will be with me. (laughs) Yeah. When we go through the valleys, and they're going to be there, and they're going to hurt, and they're going to be dark, the Lord's right there with you. I think because of this preparation for this message, it's why this silly little cartoon meant so much to me. It's a a sheep walking past a wolf and a lion, and he says, I'm with him because he's hand in hand with the shepherd. It was after finding that cartoon I found this passage. Jesus said in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. I'm not out here on my own in all of this. The Lord is my shepherd. And yes, I'm going to go through some valleys, but I'm not going to be afraid. Even if death comes, I will not be afraid. Why? Because my shepherd is armed and ready. Nothing comes to me that doesn't first go past him. And if death comes, and it will, I got nothing to be afraid of because my shepherd has already provided eternal life. So why would any of us spend another day in the grip of fear? Fear. 